Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good to see you and good to be back. Actually, I'm not paying free, but in the natural, I'm not. Totally different attack. Yeah, so the devil must despise me. Oh, yeah, I'll be fine. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to study your word, to learn and grow in you, to learn and grow in the things that we find in scripture related to us, that the eyes of our understanding will be opened so that we can better comprehend your word, Father. Because when we better comprehend your word, we better comprehend you. Because you and your word are one and the same. So I thank you for your spirit who's present with us. And by his presence, we know you are present. That you'll never leave us nor forsake us. That you're with us always. So Holy Spirit, think through my mind and speak through my lips the illumination of the revelation of God and may it go forth to meet the needs of the people, spirit, soul, and body. And I know you'll see to it that the word goes forth with clarity, unhindered and unchecked by any unseen or opposing forces because those forces have been neutralized, rendered ineffective as a result of the finished work of Christ at Calvary. And it's in that finished work that we do rest, for we have entered into your rest, Father, and there we remain, and where we remain is everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Experiencing your shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken, walking in the fullness of your blessing, flourishing in every aspect of our lives as our souls flourish. So thank you for your peace that we have access to by faith, your peace that will let rain in our hearts, We'll choose not to worry or be anxious for anything, but in prayer and supplication, we'll go to you making our requests known, knowing that your peace that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We'll be in peace in the midst of our trials and storms, a peace that we cannot explain, that we cannot put into words. We cast every care on you because you care so much for us. We do it by faith. We take no thought. We don't worry about anything regarding our lives. Rather, we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all we need will be added to us. You are Jehovah Shalom, our peace, and you're Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Every need is met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you are Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. You have healed all of us. And you have healed me. And so I thank you for every pain and ailment and infirmity and sickness and disease and malady and every name that has been named is named and every name that will be named must submit to the name of Jesus, the name that is far above those names. I curse this pain in my back now, command it to leave and curse any pain anyone else is experiencing right now in person or wherever they are. Commanded to leave now. Obey the word now. In the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that the hearts are ready. Prepared to receive the rich word. That seed will be sown into their hearts and it will produce in their lives. And we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. There's an old church song that says something good is about to happen. Something good is in store. And I have felt like this for almost two months now that something huge that that I'm going to the next level and therefore 
so are all of you. Amen. And so <laughs> my mouth, my back, just attempts for the enemy to thwart the progress that God intends for all of us to make at this time in our lives personally and, and in the life, the life of this ministry. But we are not of those who draw back. Amen. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 verse 1. We're going to start a new lesson this morning. Ephesians 2 1. Our lesson is entitled, The Age of Grace. So I'm sure you can guess what we're going to be talking about. The grace of God, and the first thing we need to discuss is how we arrived and how we have settled down in God's grace, and that's by way of what? That's by way of salvation. So here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it reads, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, According Now, before we continue to read, notice the past tense. You he made alive who were dead. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, writing to saints. And he writes to them and therefore writes to us that we were once dead in trespasses and sins. but he's now made us alive. And when we were dead in trespasses and sins, there was a course in which we walked, which also tells me that now that we've been made alive, there's a new course in which we walk. But when we were dead in trespasses and sins, and this is not talking about when we used to sin, but rather when we used to have the sinful nature, when we used to be slaves of sin. Verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Okay, so this tells me that now we walk according to the course of this word. But before that, it was the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, that is the adversary. The devil, Satan, is the prince of the power of the air. And notice that his position in the air gives him a vaulted position. It also gives him a somewhat advantageous position. Now, not advantageous over the children of God, those who know who they are and walk according to the course of this word, uh, but definitely an advantage over those who, look at what the rest of the scripture says, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So the devil's children are known as sons of disobedience. God's children would obviously be the opposite we then must be sons of obedience. And, and, and watch this. We're not sons of obedience because we obey. The devil's children are not sons of disobedience because they disobey. It has everything to do with our nature. And out of that nature will will be produced a particular lifestyle that aligns with whoever your father is. 
Who is your father? God or the devil? It doesn't mean that God can't intervene in the life of an unbeliever. That's how most got saved. And it doesn't mean that the devil is going to no longer harass those who belong to God. So once again, you we made alive, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You once walked according to the course of this world, according to who? The devil, the prince of the power of the air. That's the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted. We all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, and were by nature, and were by nature children of wrath. It doesn't matter if when we once walked this way, it doesn't matter if we never did a wrathful thing. We were still by nature children of wrath. Because when you're born into this world, you are born into sin and condemnation. You, you are born with an anti-God nature. Some of you may recall uh, when you were in sin, when you were not born again, or maybe you recall loved ones and how they operated and how they acted when they were not born again. And maybe, maybe you, you can't necessarily put your finger on any lust fulfilling or, 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 or specific or pronounced desires of the flesh in which they fulfilled. Yet their nature was still sinful and therefore by nature were children of wrath. The Bible even tells us that by nature we hate God. Sinful, the sinful nature is anti-God. A, a sinner can claim to know God or, or claim they believe in God. Maybe they don't profess the name of Jesus, but they have a, some concept of God in which they believe in that concept, whatever he, she, or it is. But according to the text, according to the Bible, they're God-haters. They're God-haters. They're children of wrath. They are individuals who fulfill the lusts of their flesh and the desires of their flesh and mind. That is due to the nature of man that we are born with when we come into this world. That is why Israel, God's chosen, God's elect, failed over and over and over again. Why? Because even though they were chosen, even though the law of Moses was given to them, they were still slaves to their sinful nature. And, 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 and this is a people who saw God move in ways you and I don't see on this side of the cross. This is a people who saw waters parted and walked through parted waters. And yet after all of the signs and wonders and repeated miracles of God, infallible proofs, evidence that cannot be denied, they still would disobey God. They'd worship false gods. Judgment would come. They'd say, no more. We won't do it again. We trust in you. And after some time, they would go right back to false, foreign, strange, heathen gods. Why? Because by nature, they were children of wrath. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were what? Dead in trespasses. If the Bible is saying that we were dead, we must no longer be dead. unless you want to count being dead to sin. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we, we are to live a life that displays us being dead to sin and alive to God. That's actually a choice, though, that we have to make. That's something that we have to do. That's something we live out. 
It says, even when we were dead in trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. Verse 5 just said that we're saved by grace. Verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is what it means to be identified with Christ. Galatians 3, 26 through 29 tells us that we have put on Christ. So there's no more slave or free. There's no more male or female. There's no more Jew or Gentile. If you've put on Christ, or if, you've belong, if you belong to Christ, you've therefore put on Christ. That, that's your identification now. You, you're, 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 from a kingdom standpoint, sure, what we see in the natural, I'm looking across the room now, I see a variety of colors. I only see two genders, but I see a variety of colors. I, I, I see different complexions. And just by looking at you, I can see that there are a number of ethnic backgrounds in this room right now. That's what I see in the natural. But that's not what God looks at. That's why he inspires Paul in Philippians 3 to write, Therefore, moving forward from now on, regard no one according to the flesh. So if you put on Christ, you have now been identified with Christ. And your identification with Christ trumps your ethnicity, your gender, your culture, your complexion, your nationality, your citizenship. It trumps all of that. It, it is now, for those of us who are children of light, for those of us who are no longer in darkness, for those of us who are the saved, our identification is with Jesus. And so part of that means that we are right now sitting together with him in heavenly places. Because the Bible also tells us that we died with him. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. Well, then if we're seated with him, that means we had to have ascended with him. Identification wise. Yes, we're right here in the earth realm carrying the message of the kingdom wherever we go. That's, we're ambassadors of Christ, so that's our job. Our job as believers is to preach the gospel of salvation to the lost and teach the gospel of the kingdom to the found. But while we're doing that, whenever God looks to his right and sees his son, he sees all of us. Because we're seated together with him, because we've been identified with him, because if you believe in him, then you've put on Christ. Amen. Verse 7, it says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay, right in the middle of that that clause, that independent clause that reads, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right there in the middle is been saved. Right in the middle is saved. What borders the salvation? Grace and faith. For what? By grace you've been saved through faith. Which means I cannot be saved without grace and faith. What, what we're going to learn, if, if we don't already know, is that, is that grace is what God does and what God has and what God dispenses. Right? As he sees fit uh, 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 for those who, who are highly favored, for, for those who, who walk according to the word, Faith is our part, right? The measure of faith has been given to us, and now we're to use that. Amen. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. 
For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's look at verse 10 first. We are His workmanship. This means we are God's work of art. We, we, are, we, are, we are the top of God's creation. We're the chief product. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works. What are good works? Deeds. The acts of the saints. The righteous acts of righteous saints. That's what works are. That's what deeds are. That is what we will be judged on when we stand at the Bema, the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, we, we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive for the deeds or according to the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Well, when was I in my body? When I was on the earth. Which tells me the judgment seat of Christ is not on the earth. The judgment seat of Christ is in heaven. So when the Lord appears and he calls us up, come hither, we'll make our way to the reward bench and we'll receive for the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Hopefully we are all only giving an account for good works. And that's up to us, by the way. We rectify that here. But that's what those good works are. Good deeds. And the Bible says what? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We should be walking in good works. That is, that is a part of the life of the believer. That is a part of the walk of the believer. Doing good deeds. Verse 9 says what? Not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're not saved because of deeds. We should do good deeds. We don't do good deeds so that we can get saved. We do good, see, good deeds because we are saved. It says, lest anyone should boast. If I'm saved because of my works, guess who gets to boast? I get to boast. Look at what I did. Look at what I acquired on my own merit. That's self-righteousness. You can't be self-righteous and God-righteous. It's one or the other. And if you're God righteous, then you didn't save you. The only, only thing you did, you accepted the gift. Now we'll look at verse 8. I'll tell you right now. Salvation is a gift. Grace is a gift. And faith is a gift. But the gift that this verse is specifically talking about is the faith by which you use to receive the grace of God. We're saved as a result of God. It is the grace of God that salvation is available for me to receive. S salvation has been provided via God's grace. take it a step forward, it's because of the grace of God that there has been made available faith to, to receive His grace or receive what He has provided as a result of His grace. Uh, Romans chapter 12 verse 3 talks about the, the measure of faith. God has dealt to every man the, the measure of faith. Right? On one hand, uh, measures are dealt for gifts. On another hand, uh, the measure of faith is, is, is dealt for every believer to live by, to, to live their kingdom life by, because we're all called to walk by faith and not by sight. The just shall what? Shall live by faith. Uh, but then watch this. There's human faith that exists apart from God. Right? Un unbelievers practice this principle of faith that we know, they just don't know the source. Right? Does not the unbelieving athlete 
who, who, who has no guarantee of a professional sports contract perform in a manner as if they know they're going to the pros. And many of them, you ask them, what, what, what is it that they have their sights set on? And you'll hear faith coming out of their mouth. They may not even know Jesus. Right? Right? That's human faith. So, so, so apart from God, there's that. But, but we're talking about the God kind of faith. And so, and so God, what? God, God, God interrupts human faith so that we can receive the salvation that He has provided as a result of His grace. And when we come, become that believer in Him, we now have a new understanding of what faith is. And from that day forward, we should begin to learn about faith and develop our faith for the lives that we're living in this earth realm, in this world as believers. But... The gift of God in, in this particular case is the gift of faith given to us to receive salvation that he has provided as a result of his grace. Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 21. This is just about setting up a foundation and 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 grasping and understanding how we even arrived in the grace of God how we have found ourselves in God's grace it's only by way of salvation if you are not saved you are not entitled to the grace of God It still is grace that made salvation available so that when the gospel is preached, you have something to receive if you so choose to receive it. We know there are those who will reject it. They will reject salvation. We also know there are those who they'll reason and say to themselves or to whoever, to whomever has preached the gospel to them, you know, I like what you're saying. Uh, let's talk about it some more. I'll hear you again on this matter. Those are the reasoners. And, of course, you have us, the receivers. We said, yes, we're in the faith. As a result of being in the faith, we're in his grace. Romans 3.21 says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. We're going to see this word law pop up quite a bit. The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. Well, if he's beginning this sentence with but now, he must have been talking about something else before. And if he's saying, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, he must have previously been talking about the righteousness of God through the law that was revealed. And that's the Mosaic law. That, 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 is, that, is, that is the law that was given to his chosen people that separated them from the rest of the, of the known world. The, re the, the rest of the people of antiquity. That which kept Israel separate from the Assyrians and the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, etc. He says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. When, when you see law and prophets, think Moses and Elijah. Verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there's no difference. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who be whoever believes. So, so salvation is, is, what's Paul preaching? Paul, who was an Israelite, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was a Pharisee, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, truly concerned about his countrymen according to the flesh, he said. But the same Paul was given the responsibility to preach this message of salvation to the Gentiles. So his assignment was apostle to the Gentiles 
yet his, his heart was always with his, his, his kinsmen. He wanted his nation to be saved as well. And, and, and so, so this revelation of the church, this revelation of justification by way of faith comes to Paul and he's preaching it. He's writing about it in his letters and his epistles. And, and while he knows that his primary audience are the Gentiles, he knows that if Jews would believe what he's preaching to the Gentiles, they'll be saved as well. Because he now knows that salvation, according to the law, is no longer salvation. That now it is complete and total reliance and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. So he says, he says verse, verse, the rest of verse 22, for there is no difference that connects to verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jew or Gentile. It says being justified freely. See, remember, what, what did Jesus, what, what did Paul say? Paul says in, in Romans 1, 1, 16, he he talks about how he's not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, for in it, it what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. He says, for in it, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says he's not ashamed of it. Notice he says for the Jew first, then the Greek, then the Gentile. Jew first, not Jew only, Jew first. Jesus, when he commissions his 12 to go forth and preach the message of the kingdom, he says first, preach only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But we realize that that only was really, was really for a, a short window of time because that only became preached first. What follows? Numerous Gentiles get, get, get the Samaritan woman at the well, John 4. The Canaanite woman of Matthew 15. The Roman centurion of Matthew 8 and Luke 7. So we see Gentiles being blessed by the ministry of Jesus. We see them being preached to. We see them exercising faith. But what was Jesus saying? I've come for my people first. I've come for God's chosen. I've come for his elect first, but not them only. Salvation is for everyone. Anyone can believe on me. Being justified freely by his grace, verse 24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Free justification comes by way of, of redemption only found in who? Christ Jesus. It says, whom God set forth as a propitiation. Literally, it, that translates in, into mercy seat. God set Jesus forth as a mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, meaning what? God's long suffering. Nobody's more patient than God. His patience, his endurance, his perseverance, his long suffering, his forbearance. We all know we would have quit on us. We don't have God's resolve. Thank God God has God's resolve. Oh, how patient the Lord is. How long suffering he is because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Watch this. If this if this is talking about the righteousness of God that is apart from the law then this must be talking about the righteousness of God that is the result of grace. Look at verse 24 again, being justified freely by his what? By his grace. Look at, look at chapter 5, starting with verse 12. This, 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 is, how, this is how Fred has found himself in God's grace. Because Fred, by faith, accepted 
the gift of salvation provided by God's grace. And when I said yes to Jesus and you said yes to Jesus, we entered into the grace of God. And we've been in the grace of God ever since we said yes to Jesus. What's unfortunate is that many believers have not taken advantage of the rest of the grace of God. Romans 5.12. Whose fault is it that we're sinners? Who's to blame? God? Is it God's fault? Is it God's fault that I was born into sin? Is it God's fault that I was born a sinner? No. No. According to Paul, Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world. So sin didn't enter the world through God, did it? Sin entered the world. And, and look, and not just sin. Guess, guess who hitched a ride with sin? Death. death through sin. So sin and death are here, not because of God, but because of man. And who was that man? Adam. The Adam sinned, violated the prohibition of God, and as a result of that, he invited sin into the world, he invited death into the world, and then he freely gave jurisdiction of the system of the world to who? To the devil. That's why the devil, with full confidence, said to Jesus, how do you say this to Jesus? It's Jesus. How, how do you go to Jesus and say, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. You want to know why Jesus, I, Satan, will give you all the kingdoms of the world? Because they were delivered to me. When were the kingdoms of the world delivered to the devil? When Adam sinned. Right there in that garden. Adam said, here you, here you go, here you go, serpent. Here you go, Satan. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin. Wait a minute. So I sinned? You sinned? Because Adam sinned? Yeah. Because, because Adam was the federal head, the vice regent of the human race. He was the first, which means what? Whatever decisions he make affect us all. Affects the whole family of mankind. So because of Adam's sin, I'm now, watch, I'm now born into sin with an appointment with death. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. If there is no law telling you what's right or wrong, you can't be held accountable for what you do. If I don't have a thou shalt not, then what am I going to do? If, if I'm not being told what not to do, And to show you how powerful the sinful nature is, when they receive the law, what they do? And still sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. You see what Paul is saying here? Look at what he's saying here. He's saying from Adam to Moses, there was no Mosaic law. But death still reigned. Now, now, historical and extra biblical Hebrew writings tell us that Noah did establish Noahic laws. He, he gave laws to his sons and, and his grandsons, the laws of God. Abraham also gave Abrahamic laws to his family. But by the time we get to Moses, we're looking at two million plus Hebrews, Israelites. So, so, so a law had to, it, it, it wasn't just verbal anymore. Something had to be codified. It had to be etched in stone. And so that began with what's known as the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments would then from there be produced the, the, the 
other 603 laws and commandments that Israel could never keep, that no man can keep today. That's why, that's why Jesus had to come. Whenever you read the Old Testament and you read scriptures where God is writing to Israel and he's saying, you will keep this for perpetual generations. You will keep this for everlasting. That means until Jesus comes. Not past Jesus, because if, if, if these ordinances and these requirements are required past Jesus, then all requirements were not met. And therefore, Jesus would not have been qualified to say it is finished. And what Paul writes to the Colossians in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, where it says, and he has wiped out the handwriting of, requ of requirement that was against us. That would then be a lie. Oh, but no, everything that was everlasting or for perpetual generations came to a close when Jesus closed out the old covenant. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. What was Paul saying? He's saying death reigned over those who may not have sinned like Adam, but because of Adam's sin, they're born into sin. Therefore, death still reigns over them. It says, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Referring to who? Jesus. Verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, pay attention to the wording here. If by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God. Much more the grace of God. And the gift by the grace. The what? The gift by the grace. So the gift of salvation is by the grace. Even the gift of faith that you've received from God is by the grace. It says much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man Jesus Christ abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in what? Condemnation. Wherever there is sin, there is guilt and condemnation. There is shame. Wherever there is faith, there is boldness and confidence. You can't be in sin and in faith. Those in the flesh can't please God. Being in the flesh is sin. Living according to the flesh is sin. Responding according to the flesh is sin. Those in the flesh are those in sin, and they can't please God. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. So that means when I'm in my flesh, I'm not in faith. When I'm in faith, I'm not in my flesh. Amen. Paul writes in Romans 14, he says, whatever is not of faith is sin. So, so verse 16 again, the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in what? Condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. And what is justification? That's when you've been declared righteous. The just are the declared righteous. The, 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 the just are the righteousness of God. Declared righteous. In the Old Testament... No one could be declared righteous. Because in order to be declared righteous, you have to have a perfect sacrifice. And there was no perfect sacrifice until Jesus. Which means every other sacrifice leading up to the perfect sacrifice was simply an acceptable one. But not one good enough to completely do away with the body of sin or, or sin's authority. An acceptable sacrifice that that appeased, but didn't fully satisfy, didn't fully meet requirements, uh, 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 an acceptable sacrifice that could not redeem, but could only atone. It could cover, but it couldn't do away with. You need a perfect sacrifice for that. So, how do we get all these Old Testament saints? 
Well, because they walked by faith. They believed God. And what does the Bible say? Specifically in regards to Abraham, and Abraham is the example setter, and they all followed his example, Genesis 15, 6. The Bible says Abraham believed God. And what did God do? He accounted it to him for righteousness, which means what? He credited him. But he didn't declare him. Couldn't declare him. Couldn't declare him because there was no Jesus, no Messiah. Abraham knew a Messiah was coming, but the Messiah hadn't come yet. But because he did believe God, he received a credit of righteousness, and all who believed God in the manner of Abraham received a credit of righteousness, which prevented them from experiencing torments in Hades, in Shoal, and in fire. However, their state did not allow them to be in heaven. So they were across the great gulf in the bosom of Abraham, in a paradise-type place. Oh, but when Jesus first descended into the lower parts of the earth, he led the captives free. He released them. He, he, he released them. They weren't in torments, but they weren't in the presence of God. Jesus brought them into the presence of God. So now, post-Christ and his work at Calvary, anyone who believes in God has to go through Jesus, and when we go through Jesus, we're declared righteous. God doesn't account it to us for righteousness. He simply declares us righteous. Verse 17, For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Christ Jesus. Jesus Christ. It says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in what? Condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were what? Were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many you guys notice that verse 19 does not read like this. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. We'll be made because unlike some who have preached this false teaching, the work of Christ did not automatically make everyone saved. You have to believe. You have to call on the name of the Lord. So why does it say many will be made righteous? Because many would believe, and many will believe, and many still will believe. But it's not automatic. Because if it's automatic, that means from the moment Christ's work was finished, all would then be born in righteousness. And I think we know based on the condition of the world from the time of the death of Jesus up until now, folk ain't born in the righteousness. We can look at history and we can look at the state of the world today and we can know men are still born into sin. So, so you, you have to accept Christ's completed work. It's not an automatic thing. Verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, what abounded more? I don't care where sin is. I don't care how much it abounds. I don't care what the situation is. Grace always wins. Grace always abounds much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what have we read in Romans 5? What have we read in Romans 3? What have we read in Ephesians 2? We have read that we're saved as a result of the grace of God. That justification is freely received by an act of faith in the finished work of Christ. When I do that, when, when, when you do a Romans 
and you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead, you enter into the grace of God. Now, what else does that mean? Wouldn't you think that there would be more to the grace of God than just saving grace? Because if it was solely about that, it seems to me that it would make sense that the moment I got born again, God should just, he'd just kill me. <laughs> and just bring me up there with him. Amen. I mean, what, 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 what better way to pull your chosen out of the world than to cause them to expire the moment they're born again. And yet, that doesn't happen, does it? No, we get born again and there's still more life to live. So what are we supposed to do? Living that life. And does the grace of God have any part in that? And if it does, okay, what part? What does it mean? What does it look like, smell like, taste like, etc.? So now, we need to understand what it means to exist and live under the dispensation of grace. Because that's the dispensation we've been under ever since Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father. Actually, it began, it began, it began when he died. Because the Bible says that a, that a testament has no power while the man lives. The testator has to die. The moment Technically, according to Hebrews 9, 16 and 17, the moment he died, the New Testament was in play, was in operation, was in force. So ever since he died, we've been in the dispensation of grace. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? Look at Ephesians 3. Hallelujah. An understanding of grace will give you a better understanding of faith. Ephesians 3, verse 1. When you have it, say, I have it. For this reason, what reason? Whatever we didn't read in chapter 2. <laughs> you see how important it is to read Scripture in context. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles. See, when you hear the word prisoner, nothing about that sounds appealing. Neither does the word slave. Especially if you're a, of a particular complexion. You hear that word slave. That's not an appetizing word. Ask you if anyone has experienced any kind of slavery, because there are actually more people enslaved today than ever. All, all the sex, sex trafficking of women and of children, that's slavery. Slavery exists in some nations. Uh, I mean, it almost is a, an exact replication of old world slavery. So, so anyone who's experienced slavery, just like anyone who's experienced prison, would most likely tell you, I don't look forward to either of those. I would look forward to it because I've experienced it. They probably would be slow to refer to themselves as a prisoner or as a slave. And yet, in the sixth chapter of Romans, Paul says, instead of being slaves of sin, we should be slaves of righteousness. Right now, Paul calls himself... The prisoner of who? Christ Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, if there's one prisoner that I want to be, or if there's one person that I want to be a prisoner of or a slave to, it's Jesus. Because it won't be prison and it won't be slavery. All right, these are just strong words that talk about one's commitment to the Savior. So what does Paul say? This reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, he says, if indeed, if indeed, Assuming you've heard about this, if indeed you have heard of the what? 
the dispensation of the grace of God. Now, normally when we use the word dispensation, we're talking about a period of time. But, but a better word is administration. Well, we are under the administration of grace. The, the, if indeed you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for who? For you. Who's Paul writing to? He's writing to the Ephesians. He's writing to Ephesian believers. Those called to be saints at Ephesus, and then ultimately those called to be saints. But the Ephesians were, they were Gentiles. Now you had, Jew, you had pockets of Jews everywhere. You had pockets of Jews. The Jews were scattered. So you had Jews in Rome, you had Jews at Corinth, you had, you had Jews everywhere. And, and, and you, you can always tell when Paul is talking to his kinsmen in a given epistle. B but for the most part, he's, these are Gentile territories. So he says, he says, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me, Paul, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, for you, Ephesian Gentile believers... How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul talks a lot about mysteries in the New Testament. Mysterion, secrets which have been divinely revealed. Paul is the one that, that receives the abundance of, of revelation regarding the mystery. The church was a mystery that would later be revealed. That's why when you go to the Old Testament, scour all of the prophets, not one prophecy about the church. What do the, what do the Old Testament prophet, prophets prophesy about? They prophesy about the birth of Jesus. They prophesy about the restoration of Israel. They prophesy about the fearful and dreadful day of the Lord. Prophets are seers. So why didn't one prophet prophesy about the church? Because they couldn't see it. Couldn't see it. Because God hid it in a mystery. And he hid it in a mystery so the devil wouldn't catch wind. Now, by the time the mystery is revealed, the devil's such a perverted copycat that he still has to, even though it's already late, he still has to come up with his own mysteries. And that's why we read about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the mystery of lawlessness. Mystery of sin. There's nothing original about him. Everything. He's a cheap copy. He's a cheap copy. Now, if you're fine with cheap copies, if, if that's what works for you. Me, personally, I like to pass on cheap copies. Now, I'm not judging you if you prefer to go to Santee or Los Angeles Street, downtown L.A. in the alley, and you see that purse, those look like Louis Vuitton icons on that purse. And the guy says, just give me 65, give me 70. That right there lets you know that's not a. Or it was stolen and, 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 and then it doesn't matter what they charge you because it didn't cost them to make anything. So $20 for a real Louis would be profit if they stole it. You have situations like that as well, but then you have just blatant copies. And some of y'all, you don't care. And guess what? I ain't mad at you. Do whatever works for you. But when it comes to God, make sure you pick the original. Make sure you <laughs> don't go with the copy. <laughs> don't go with the cheap knockoff. And that's what the devil is. He's a cheap knockoff. Nothing original about him. So Paul says what? He says, look at verse 3. He says, by revelation. Oh, the only way to know the mystery was by revelation. It had to be revealed. So Jesus revealed the revelation of the church to Paul. He revealed the revelation of the gospel being now available to the Gentiles as well. That was revealed to Paul. 
as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages it wasn't made known to the sons of men. Did you hear that? In other ages it wasn't made known to them. As it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. Oh, when did we get apostles? We didn't, we didn't get apostles until the ministry of Jesus and the New Testament church. Prophets existed before, but these prophets are in conjunction with apostles. So these are prophets in the era of Jesus and in the era of the church. That mystery has been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. What's the mystery? Well, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the what? Grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. I became a minister according to the gift of the grace. See, this is grace now that, that's going beyond, grace that goes beyond salvation, all right, or grace that paints a broader picture of what comes with salvation. You know, when you get saved, you become a minister. Every, every, every saved person is a minister. Amen. Every saved person is, is a servant. Diakonia in, in the Greek. That don't mean you're an apostle. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're a pastor. The Bible's very clear. He's given some to be. Not all to be. But all have been called to the ministry of reconciliation. So we are all ministers of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all ministers of salvation. It is our job to go to the world and say, you've been reconciled back to God. You want to know how to get back to God? Let me introduce you to Jesus. Amen. We're all supposed to do that. We're all called to do that. But look, look what he says here again in, in, in verse 6. It says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Why, why, why is this such a mystery? Well, wasn't it obvious that God chose Israel only? But now, now Paul is preaching a gospel that says those outside of Israel can be saved as well. Look at verse 8. To me who am less than the least. Paul worked hard at remaining humble. Because Saul was prideful. I was a prideful Pharisee. Arrogant. Zealous. He took that zeal over into the Christian faith, which was great because it made him completely fearless. But he had to keep his arrogance in check. I, I personally, I believe that is what he's talking about in, in Romans 7. When he's talking about, he's, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm working overtime not to do the stuff I hate. And, and I'm telling you, there's, there's, there's a good five or six scriptures where Paul puts extras, he puts extras on his, on, his, on his lack of deserving to be what Jesus has called him to be. He does it right here. To me who am less than the least, of all the saints, this grace was given, so he knows it's only by the grace of God, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Everything was created through Jesus Christ. The Logos became flesh, Jesus Christ. All things were created through him. It says, which from the beginning of the ages had been hidden in him. Because remember, God, God only has now. It's still Sunday for God. Just now, that's all he has. So for God, everything happened today. I really need you to understand that. Because he sits outside of time. Because the wielder of time and the creator of time is not bound by time. He created it. He gave time all of its rules. So he's not bound by the laws of physics. The creator of the law is not bound by... Now let me tell you what he is bound by. He's bound by his word. And so God cooperates with himself. You know what kind of integrity that takes? You know what kind of integrity it takes to not violate your own word, to have all power and not utilize all power when you might feel like utilizing all power, but you bind yourself with your own word? 
That's true power. He says, from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Let's just finish through verse 13. To the intent that now, whatever follows now was not known before. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by who? The church to the principalities and powers where? In the heavenly places. That means celestial creatures that have existed longer than us are going to learn something from us. There's something that they will not see until they see it from us. Manifold wisdom. They've seen God's wisdom. They haven't seen manifold wisdom. The only way they'll see manifold wisdom is by way of us, the church. That's the multi-leveled and layered wisdom of God. Verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have what? Boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul said we have boldness and access with confidence. Boldness and access with confidence. Boldness and access with confidence. So I can access confidently. I can, that's why Hebrew says that I can approach the throne of grace boldly to obtain Mercy and grace in time of need. I, boldly I can go. Not, he, not, not, not with timidity, not hesitating. I can approach, the, and I don't have to go find the high priest. Amen. High priest, can you go in there for me? Can you ask God for me? No. Because we're priests. We've been, we've been made. Those of us who've been washed in his blood, we've been made to be priests. We are a royal priesthood. Not all priesthoods are royal. Some priesthoods are just priesthoods, but we're royal priesthoods. You know, it comes with our, uh, with our, our priestly titles. King. Royal, a royal priesthood is a kingly priesthood. And that's what we've been made. If you've been washed in his blood, you're royal priest. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is life and truth. We will not cannot return to you void. It'll accomplish what it's set out to do. It'll prosper where it's sent. I thank you that the word has been sent and it is seed incorruptible. It will not, it cannot return to you empty or vain or useless. Father, your word be so when you send it, you send it to accomplish. And where you send it, you intend for it to prosper. That's what your word does. Your word goes forth, it accomplishes, and it prospers. Thank you right now that the hearts of the ground, we called early on, Father, ready hearts have received the rich word, and it'll produce in their lives. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for making the invitations I'll mention in just a moment available to those present. And if you don't know Jesus, you can know him today. Paul was very clear as to how we receive salvation and why it's been made available to us. So you can receive the gift of salvation by faith made available as a result of the grace of God. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit, you can be filled today. Every believer should be filled. Not, not must be to be saved. You're already saved. Praise God. You don't need to be filled with the Spirit to see heaven when you pass away. But you need to be filled with the Spirit. You must be filled with the Spirit in order to be a witness for the King. The, the, the Jerusalem saints, the, the apostles, all in the upper room, they did not go forth preaching the gospel until they received power from heaven. And they were filled with the Spirit. They spoke with other tongues. The initial sign that one is filled, it's not the only sign. But it's the initial sign, the primary sign, that one is filled with the Spirit. Only requirement is that you're born again. And just like salvation, by an act of faith, you can receive the gift of the Spirit. You can be filled with the Spirit. Number three is to become a part of this local body, local body of believers. There, there's a time where saints need to assemble together and be equipped by, by the governmental positions in the Lord's church. If you're not a part of one, and you showed up here today, it was not by accident. If you're not a part of an online family, 
You tuned in today. It was not by accident. This is a ministry where you'll learn and flourish in, in the taught word of God. And lastly, number four is for assurance of salvation. God wants you to know without a shadow of a doubt you're saved. Or you can't get born again again. It's nowhere in the Bible. But you may need assurance, and you can have that assurance today. The kind of assurance to where you know without a doubt I'm saved. No one can talk you out of it. If you want that assurance, we can provide it for you today. Those four again to be saved, to be filled with the Spirit, to make Crenshaw your home for assurance of salvation. If any one of these or combination of these apply to you wherever you are, raise your hand up high wherever you're seated. Go ahead, raise your hand at home too. I can't see your hand, but we're going to say a prayer together in a second that will cover whatever you're raising your hand uh, 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 regarding. Okay, I see no hands in this place. So let's repeat these two prayers for salvation in the Holy Spirit. For salvation, simply say, Dear God, Dear God I, repent I repent of my sins. I confess with my mouth, with my mouth. The, Lord the Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that you've raised him from the dead. Therefore, I'm now saved. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. To be filled with the Spirit, simply repeat after me, saying, Heavenly Father, by faith, I receive the gift of the Spirit. I am now filled with the Spirit. I have received my heavenly language. But most importantly, I'm now a witness for the King and Kingdom. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen. All right, if you prayed these prayers, you're saved, filled with the Spirit. This email address, this is how you can reach out to us if you have questions about salvation or being filled with the Spirit. Or if you're curious about becoming a part of our EIF family or you want that assurance. If there's anyone in here and you prayed these prayers for the very first time or, or a similar prayer, in other words, You've never prayed a prayer of salvation or a prayer to be filled with the Spirit, and you could not say for sure that you're saved or filled. Come forward now. If not, I will assume and deduce, and I believe I can do that safely based on your lack of response, that you're all saved. You know Jesus. And not only do you know Jesus, you're filled with the Spirit. Amen. Praise God. Well, it's time to give. Time to sow. And the Bible tells us the kind of giver that God loves, the kind of giver we're to be. Cheerful giver, happy and hilarious giver. And there are a number of ways that we can display our happiness and our hilarity, but ultimately it is the condition of the heart. And so... Paul says, whatever one sows, so shall that one reap. We know that we will reap in due season if we faint not and we do not lose heart. I read earlier in Ephesians 2.10 that we are his workmanship created for good works. And one of the, one of the goodest works... I don't know a gooder work <laughs> is giving. It's giving and, and giving to the cause of, of, of the kingdom via a ministry or even when you just, when you just bless someone, when you bless a stranger. That, that, that's, that's, that's the good work. That's us being his workmanship in operation. So if you're ready to give, lift your gifts up. Do you, do you actually believe that when you sow, you'll reap? Do you, be, do you believe that? Is this just habit for you? Is this just tradition? Is this just routine? Or do you actually believe it? Father, we thank you when we praise you for the opportunity to sow towards what you're doing in the earth realm. We count it an honor and privilege to be what you call us, workers together with you, laborers going forth into the plentiful harvest, and I thank you that as we, as we give this day, according to what we have, as we purpose in our heart, doing so cheerfully, that we will reap the corresponding manifold return on our giving. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen.
Father, we thank you for your healing power. We thank you for, for departed pain and pain departing throughout the course of this time we've had together for those in which it may not have yet. We thank you that, that they remain in faith and we remain in faith in agreement with them that it will depart as we have called your covenant name, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. So we thank you that your healing power has filled this place and filled the homes and vehicles and, and workspaces of, of whoever, wherever they are, watching online. We rejoice with those who have received and, and continue to stand with those who are waiting to see that manifestation. We all believe we receive it. We know that we have what we've prayed for when we have prayed according to your will, Father. We know you hear us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. 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 Uh, if there is anyone you'd like the hand of a believing one laid on you, the ushers will bring you forward. Otherwise, we will move on. All right. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. One more? Oh, okay. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Hallelujah. All right. Okay, before we close, a few things. As always, thank you for showing up. Thank you for tuning in, online family. 45th Annual Wisdom from Above Luncheon with Dr. Betty Price, as always, is sold out. A limited number of final tickets will be on sale Sunday in the bookstore after service. Um, the CCC Worship Arts Department invites you to their Praise and Worship Rehearsal Open House tomorrow, September 28th from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the Faith Dome. Come out for a free-flowing night of praise and worship. Um, intercessors who normally attend an intercessory prayer, come out if you can, but, but I realize it's always good to have at least one watchman on the wall still, so if there are any that want to continue with intercessory prayer, uh, then we're going to go ahead and keep it for tomorrow as well. Uh, but invite your, your family and friends, uh, and let's glorify God together. Minister Brenda Daniel is launching the first virtual global leadership exchange summit known as GLES on September 29th and 30th. The panel leaders will represent seven countries. Among them will, will be our very own Pastor Mike Amy in Namibia, Minister Mignonette Bailey, as well as myself, You'll be inspired to share the gospel using your unique gifts and talents. Click on the QR code on the screen to register and receive the streaming link. And then lastly, I am kindly, everyone say kindly. <laughs> I'm kindly asking that everyone uh, exit uh, expeditiously, decently, and in order. Uh, we actually have a, a shoot that we have to begin at 1230. So please adhere to that. Thank you. Let's stand. Father, we thank you and we praise you always for the opportunity to feast on the word and we thank you for your grace. We thank you that we live under the dispensation of grace and we thank you for divine protection as a result of your grace. You've given your angels charge over us as a result of your grace and so we thank you that they're protecting us from all hurt and harm and every satanic assignment set against us is canceled now and immediately, and that we who are the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the children of God, the heirs of salvation, we have ministering spirits ready to minister for us when we declare the word of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. amen.
We'll see you tonight.